It was Albert's quest to share his collection of over 60 years, not to just hang it on the wall, but to share it with future generations of students, scholars, researchers, etc. Well, that made for what I consider a really perfect marriage because under this current administration with Provost Lerman and President Knapp, the Washington, George Washington University's quest is to be to provide excellence in education to future generations. So that's celebration one, coming together in what I think is a perfect marriage. The second celebration is, I'm an old country boy, and I really had to understand somebody spending 60 years dedicated to collecting information about our nation's federal city. Now, most of you know this, but I did not. You don't go into a gallery and say, I'll take that one, I'll take that one, I'll take that one. You don't go online and say, oops, that looks good, let me get that. Or you don't go to any shop and say, I'll take that one. You might get a phone call and says, this piece is going to be sold at some date. Well, the process of selling it is generally through auctions. Now, you spend months, literally years, validating, number one, is this really authentic? Number two, what's the financial value of this piece? Then you conjure up, well, my budget is X. After years and months of this, you go into an arena where the selling process may last two to three minutes, and you've got to be responsive. This is as close to battlefield decision making as you can get. <laughs> now, if I were Albert, I would have had my physician on this side with a blood pressure. I'd had my bartender on this side <laughs> pouring me bourbons, and I probably had a gun in my pocket. <laughs> but realize that the emotional strain that says, I really want this piece, but my top bid is X. And the auctioneer is going, okay, do I hear X plus? And he gets X, or he or she gets X plus. Then you go, oops, my budget's gone, but I really want this. So I go X plus plus, stress, blood pressure, and you can't go, time out, let me talk about this, let me think. It's going once, going twice, gone to X plus plus. So you can imagine 60 years of this. <laughs> and that leads us to our third celebration. The 86th anniversary of Albert Small's birth was October the 15th. So for 86 years old, <laughs> 86 years young and still in the arena, doing these things. You're phenomenal, Albert. Now, it's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Provost Lerman. Steve Lerman's been around about a little over a year. I think in July it was a year. I've been around as a trustee for about 25 years. I've seen a lot of changes in this university, and none have been better than having Steve Lerman as our provost. He has brought collaboration, he's brought excellence, and you gotta understand that this all came about because he went to something called MIT, or MIT, <laughs> and um, you can really understand his success when you look at, he got his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering, he's got his Master of Science in Civil Engineering, He's got his PhD in transportation systems analysis. Boy, does that add up to being in academia? <laughs> I haven't a clue. But it led to his success at MIT, or better known as Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He became vice chancellor. And this university is honored and privileged to have him as our provost. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Steve Lerman. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, 
Uh, I'll add to that one comment that the chairman of the Board of Trustees, when I first met him, Russ Ramsey, uh, we're having a very good conversation, very engaged, and, and he looks at me in the eyes and he says, you know, you don't communicate like an engineer. Uh, and uh, so I told him the, the standard engineering joke, which is an extroverted engineer is someone who stares at your shoes while he's talking to you rather than your, his own shoes. Um, but <laughs> take a little while for that one to go around the room. <laughs> but I'd like to thank you for that kind introduction and welcome everyone to what I think is going to be an extraordinary event. Uh, one of the wonderful things about this collection, and there are many, many things about the collection, but I think there's sort of at least two exciting aspects to it. The first is the nature of the artifacts themselves. These are things of tremendous historical significance. They, they speak to us about the, the founding of a city and the evolution of that city. And like any collection of artifacts uh, that's assembled in a careful way that, that uh, Albert Smalls collected these, they really form a corpus that, that really talks to us uh, as citizens of Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area. And of course, GW has its roots deeply bed, embedded within a city. What I think is what's exciting in addition to bringing it specifically to a university such as ours is that we have the ability to integrate that collection into the academic enterprise. So unlike some of the other places mentioned that might have uh, been given the privilege of housing this collection. One of the things we can do is link this to how students learn, how they understand history, how they make meaning out of a collection of artifacts, uh, and have our faculty guide them in that. And I think truly that's really the synergy here. The real value of this combination of GW's place and this collection of artifacts really circles around the academic program, which I think is incredibly exciting. And I think we even hear some today one concrete manifestation of that vision, which is this first uh, symposium. But this first symposium is only going to be a small piece of how this collection ultimately influences the students here and the faculty here, how they learn, how they teach, and how they understand our history as a, co a country and as a city. Uh, those of you, many of you probably already know, uh, we are in the process of beginning the design of the GW Museum that will house this collection. Uh, it will be located right here on Foggy Bottom, uh, so this collection will have exhibit space uh, in which those who come here to our campus to come look at things, uh, it will become one of the things that draws people from outside, sitting right here in the heart of Washington, D.C. Uh, we're also going to be constructing a, a conservation and storage facility. Uh, as with all collections, not everything can always be exhibited simultaneously. Pieces of the collection will rotate into display places, and the ability to store and curate these materials, uh, document their history, uh, will also be done. That will actually be built out at the Virginia Science and Technology campus, uh, which is in Loudoun County in Ashburn. Uh, and so we are going to begin design and, of course, construction in the not too distant future uh, of that facility. So, this collection, this wonderful gift uh, from Albert Small, really will, will integrate and bring together so many things. So, as I said, this first symposium is, is a piece of the larger uh, puzzle of how we're going to be using this collection, but it actually is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, our, our future speaker. Uh, and then we'll have the good fortune of hearing from Albert Small himself uh, to talk about it. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kenneth Bowling. Uh, he serves as an adjunct associate professor of history. He received his doctorate in history uh, from the University of Washington and joined the George Washington University in 1974. Uh, he's a noted scholar of the American Revolution and he is co-editor of something called the Documentary History of the First Federal Congress spanning 1789 to 1791. So the, the history of, of really the, the beginnings of the modern government that we now uh, enjoy. Uh, he's the author of a book called Peter Charles L'Enfant, uh, which is a biography of the French-born American citizen and U.S. Army officer. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Bowling. Human beings collect all sorts of things, books, manuscripts, art, music in all sorts of formats, fossils, arrowheads, postcards, you name it. I'm sure that everyone in this room at some time in their life has been a collector. Most of us uh, see it 
as a passing fancy, a relatively short time, short term hobby, but not for all. For some, it is a lifelong passion. Beginning during the American Revolution, editors sought to preserve the history of the event by collecting the documentary record. Before the Civil War, Washington Mayor Peter Force pulled together a diverse collection of manuscripts, saving them and the history they contained from many a fireplace. At the time of the centennial of the Revolution, as the grandchildren of the revolutionaries began to get rid of their family papers, manuscript collecting came into its own. Individuals such as Simon Grotz and Thomas Emmett amassed huge collections. They and others specialized in collecting signers of the Declaration of Independence, signers of the Constitution, and members of the first Federal Congress. Such great collectors value their accomplishment and want to make certain that the collection stays intact. Those of Force, Grotz, and Emmett went to the Library of Congress, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, and the New York Public Library, respectively. Others went to universities. At the end of the Civil War, the Madison, Wisconsin historian Lyman Draper filled carpet bags with cash, boarded a train bound for the former Confederate States, where he purchased the 18th century and early 19th century papers of bankrupt families, including those of two members of the first Federal Congress. Today, they are at the University of Wisconsin. Edwin J. Beinecke's and Hubert H. Bancroft's great collections of Western Americana are at Yale and the University of California, Berkeley. A collection of papers of Revolutionary War British and American generals brought together by William Clements is at the University of Michigan. To these distinguished men and institutions, we can add the names of Albert H. Small and the George Washington University. This is a great honor for us at a time in our history when the university is rapidly becoming the institution envisioned by its namesake. As an aside, uh, I can't resist saying that George Washington was not only the first president of the United States, but also to see the first president to see his proposals ignored by Congress. <laughs> <coughs> Over six decades, Albert Small has specialized in collecting Washingtoniana, the place, not the man, although the man is certainly part of it. The collection's hundreds and hundreds of items include manuscripts, maps, prints, posters, photographs, broadsides, books, newspapers, artifacts, and even, if one looks in his conference room, souvenirs like ashtrays. The collection spans American history from the 17th century to the present. There is a concentration on Civil War Washington when Americans first began to take pride in the city and to refer to it as a capital rather than a seat of government. Another focus is the 1790s, when George Washington micromanaged the initial implementation of Peter L'Enfant's grand and original plan. Uh, sorry, another aside here. Uh, if anyone tells you that L'Enfant based his plan on Paris, you might tweak them a bit by reminding them that the wide avenue Paris that we know was born in the 1850s, and that perhaps, just perhaps, it might have been based on Washington. <laughs> the collection is particularly rich in maps of the Middle States. The Capitol building is to be seen throughout the collection. Other maps would include the Capitol region itself, and of course the district. But my favorite part is the many bird's eye views. These large prints, often with each and every building clearly delineated, date from the start of the 19th century to that point in the 20th when birds could no longer fly high enough to view the city in its entirety. Members of the George Washington University community 
especially its students, as well as interested people from throughout the world will come to campus to view this visually delicious collection and to use its resources for research purposes. And so, Mr. Small, we thank you for having the collecting bug, mm -hmm. for focusing on Washington, and especially for your decision to place your wonderful collection at the George Washington University. And now we look forward to hearing your comments on it this morning. So first of all, thank you for those insightful comments and placing the, coll the collector in context. Uh, um, so we're going to move on to uh, really what we hope will be a conversation. Uh, and I'd like to invite, of course, Mr. Small uh, here and introduce to you uh, Professor Laura Schiavo, uh, who is sitting uh, to uh, Mr. Small's right. Uh, he is an she is, excuse me, assistant professor in the Museum Studies Program at George Washington University. Uh, she's held positions at the National Bank uh, Building Museum, the City Museum, and the Jewish Historical Society of the Greater Washington Area. And while at the City Museum, she actually curated an exhibit of the small collection for the City Museum of Washington. So she has uh, a pre-existing familiarity with this collection. So thank you for being with us today. And Mrs. Small, we're delighted to have the privilege of hearing directly from you about this unique collection. And so I'll turn the conversation over to you. Thank you. Can you, make, can you make sure that you're on? <laughs> Did you say something? Yeah, okay, everybody can hear? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Provost Lerman. I am delighted to be with, here with you, Mr. Small, to talk about your collection and really to be able to share that conversation with everyone assembled here, which is a wonderful, wonderful assembly of professors, historians, scholars, students, museum professionals, and I know from just looking around the room here, a lot of people who know the history of Washington and care about the history of Washington. And so as Provost Lerman alluded to, I do have a bit of history with this collection myself, although not 60 years worth, um, uh, because I did do, uh, I curated an exhibition of this collection. I you for one sure, minute. absolutely. Yeah. See, what? see how we've already got it going. <laughs> That's why my hair is white. <laughs> Sixty years worth. Right. Um, and so, before we quite get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the work of James Good. James is here, over here. Um, When I, when I did that, uh, curated that show at the City Museum, I did it with James, and without him, it would have been impossible, um, not nearly as educational and not nearly as fun. Um, and Mr. Uh, James has been working with Mr. Small's collection for 15 years, and we are here at GW, we are very thankful for the work that he's done because it is as well cataloged and organized as it is because of, in, in large part, due to James's work. So thank you, James. So now let's get started. Um, so as you know, we're going to be um, looking at some of your amazing collection when we go to the next room for lunch because it was Mr. Small's vision when he first saw the room uh, where we'll be eating. He said, this is a nice room. It's a little boring. <laughs> it's a little institutional. It needs some stuff. Um, and as museum people and historians, we certainly appreciate needing stuff. So we will be seeing some of those works when we go into lunch. But for now, the slides are going to have to do. So the first slide that we have here, um, I'm hoping you will, it takes a little bit of a turn for you, um, but this is um, a 1790 manuscript map of the area that would become Washington, D.C. It was done by a local surveyor named John Prigg. So my first question to you to get into this is, is about maps. Um, I think some people look at maps and get very excited, and some people look at maps and gloss over. So I'm wondering, what made you interested in this map, or maps in general? What do you see in them? Well, every map's different. They're done by a person, typically. This map was, <coughs> was done before the L'Enfant plan was. What it shows is the uh, eastern branch of the Potomac River, which is now called the Anacostia River, and it shows the houses that existed at that time. It also shows a, a dirt path 
road uh, from the Eastern Branch Ferry, which was a ferry boat that went across the river over to Georgetown. Bear in mind, there was no Washington then. Washington didn't exist. So the road was just a, a dirt path that went from the ferry boat over, the, over that river over to Georgetown, which did exist. And when L'Enfant, we don't know this for a fact, but the only thing we can surmise is that he had to see, had to see this plan because this plan showed that road. And that road became in the L'Enfant plan the path for Pennsylvania Avenue. And Pennsylvania Avenue, as we know it today, is exactly on that path that's on that map that's on the wall. And when you see that, that that's the major part of the map that really picture, uh, just turns you on. You see that, I mean, you realize what a wonderful thing that is. Now, how did I find that map? People all over the country know that I collect Washingtoniana. And so I, I've, I've been collecting, as, as Bob told you, for 60 years. Well, 60 years you get to know a lot of people in the, that are dealers in maps and, and other material like that. So one dealer uh, came across this and he said, Albert, well, you should have it. And he sent it down to me to look at and obviously I bought it. But uh, <laughs> that's the net kind of network you have to have. You physically can't be everywhere. There are auctions all over the country. The dealers all over the country. You can't be at every dealer's shop. You can't be at every auction. But you have people who know that you collect and, and they contact me. So I have that as well as, as just going to the other places and the, and, the, and the auctions and the book fairs and map fairs. Every, every January there's an international map fair in, in Miami. Dealers come from all over the world and bring their maps there. And typically I go to that as well. But, you know, there's a limit to how many places you can go to in the world. You can't go everywhere. But this particular map that's up on the wall now, a, a dealer and a friend uh, let me know that it was available, and he said, you should have it. Well, so I bought it. So actually, that's a perfect um, segue, because I want to cast everybody's mind back to a time when you were not Albert H. Small, known as a collector of Washington, but you were a... I don't know, 25-year-old person. Um, and you told me a great story when we spoke a number of weeks ago about the first item you collected related to Washington in New York um, when you were in New York. And I was wondering if you could share that story with us. I'm going to scratch my head a little bit, but I guess I can probably <laughs> scratch it cold both sides and <laughs> try to remember it. Oh, back in, before I started <coughs> really collecting maps, I used to go up to New York, and my wife-to-be was a student up in New York City at the time. And part of her curriculum was that she had to work on Saturdays. So I'd go up on the weekends to visit her, be with her, and Saturday I had nothing to do. So I used to walk, you know, it's a very urban city, and, and lots of interesting things on the streets to look at, shops and and bookshops and all kinds of things, which we don't didn't have in Washington. And I'm not a country boy, but I'm a Washingtonian, and Washingtonian 60 years ago was not a really big urban community. Well, I grew up to New York on the weekends, and I had nothing to do on Saturday. I used to wander the streets, and, and I'd never been to bookstores before. And you wander into them, and they're old bookstores, and, I began to look at some of the items, and I came across one item. It was an old manuscript uh, book that was done about 1900. So it's not that early, but what it was just piqued my curiosity. It was a manuscript, because Washington, when it was laid out, they surveyed the city, and it's, it's 10 square miles, so it's, it, there's a there's a cornerstone at each one of the four corners, and every mile there's another stone that was placed. Well, these people back in 1900, which was 100 and some years after, after the city was laid out, their curiosity was peaked. They wanted to find the stones. 
and they got a survey instrument and a group of people. And they used to go on the weekends, and they would go with a chain, and they'd measure a mile, and they'd get a stone, and they'd find the stone, and they had a group of people with them. And they would take pictures of what was around it, and they would describe what was around it, and then they would go to the next one. Well, it didn't overnight. It took a long period of time to do it. And they put it together in a book, but the paper wasn't very good because they didn't really think about the posterity of it and how it was going to last. I came across it in a bookstore. It wasn't very expensive because it wasn't something that would pique a lot of people's curiosity. But for some reason or another, it, it, it tickled mine, and that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. And from then on, it was all Washington material. I read the book. Now, that's 60 years later, uh, the book is beginning to deteriorate and the paper's deteriorating. So I've got an, an archival box, so it, it, at least it'll stay in one place. But it's, it, it was published some years later by the, what was called then the Columbia Historical so so Society. So it's actually been published, so it's available in print. But well, it's a fascinating thing, and, and uh, that's how it got started. What's I love that story. Um, so we've, now we've just talked about two items in your collection, this early manuscript from 1790 and then the 1900 manuscript that, but that is really about the founding because it's about those boundary stones. And so, um, but we know that your collection goes into the 20th century. So I'm wondering when you started to collect or as you collect, did you have um, a vision for where this was going or did you kind of end up with your 600 some odd pieces and it's sort of more than you ever imagined. It just kept going. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't stop. Uh, well, you know, once you're in the collecting world, I don't know how many people are here to collect, but once you're bitten with collecting, I mean, there's no stopping what you do, <laughs> whether it's art or whatever. I mean, you, you can't stop. You go to the book sales, or you go to art sales or whatever. Uh, uh, we have, uh, my wife is interested in art. But sure enough, I came home a couple nights ago, and she said, there's a, uh, some, some paintings and the dealer in Aspen, Colorado, and we have to get them. <laughs> you know how you have to get them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been married six, basically 60 years, <laughs> and uh, what do you need? You don't need any more. That's why we're giving these away. <laughs> 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 we got to get them. <laughs> sure enough, that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, so you, I, I love the story that you tell about going into this bookstore in, in New York and seeing this piece that maybe no one was paying attention to, and, and it, was, it sparked your curiosity. But I guess... I might add one thing about collecting. Uh, it, I'm sure a lot of you collect, but it's one of the things that you can do by yourself. You don't have to call people up to, to play golf or tennis, or swim, or do anything. You can do it on your own. And it's a very wonderful hobby to have uh, on your own. Because I don't consult with anybody. And so I do it on my own. And I, I found it very, very enjoyable. I also do those other things as well. But that is for me, personally. And that, it's very gratifying. So what, it's interesting that you talk about that sort of the solitude of it because my next question is about um, the more social or competitive aspect um, that uh, we've all, we've heard reference to already today about the sort of the process and the excitement of purchasing at auction, um, very different than wandering into a, into a used bookstore in New York. So um, you've already shared with uh, me some pretty funny <laughs> and exciting stories about auctions, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to talk, talk to us about one of those. Well, I don't think we have enough time to listen to all of them. <laughs> we, we could go on all day long about what happens at auction. But I had one very interesting <coughs> experience. Some years ago, I was at the auction, and this is a major, major auction of um, manuscripts. And I had the dealer who, who used to, who represented me and bid for me, was with me, 
and in the auction room, and a guy named Malcolm Forbes, who was a major collector at the time, <laughs> was in the room with his dealer. And this is a collection of signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, there are 56 people who signed the Declaration. And it's one of the things, that, as in, the, in the manuscript world, collecting is to get a complete collection of signers of the Declaration of Independence. Bearing in mind, they all had to live in 1776, so they're long gone. Whereas you could collect letters of the presidents of the United States. I mean, you go from George Washington up to the present day. I mean, there, there's three or four presidents who are still alive, but the signers of the Declaration were all gone basically by 1800 or so. Anyway, this collection came up for sale. And the bidding, if you've been to auction, you know they don't take very long. I mean, the hands go up, and it's like that. Well, there's a limit to how much any one person can bid on with the resources you have. So it's very heated, and I'm bidding, and other people in the room are bidding. And finally got up to about here for me. I had to, I was breathing a little hard, and with Bob Perry talking about it, I, my pulse would begin to <laughs> kick up a little bit. And finally, I told the dealer next to me, I said, let's hold off. And so we stopped. And then the next bidder was the one who got it. So I was the under bidder. The bidder, the, the, the winning bidder was Malcolm Forbes. <laughs> Well, he got it, and I, I also bear in mind that I did a little research on this collection. I happen to know that a year, a year from then, another collection of signs of the Declaration of Independence would be coming up for sale. And I had found out what was in that other one as far as the quality of the letters that were in it. I think if I don't get this one, I know I'll have an opportunity for the other one. So that's why I didn't pursue it up to the ultimate to get it. And I didn't get it. Sure enough, the following day, the dealer who represented Malcolm Forbes called my dealer and said uh, to my dealer, whose name was Mary Benjamin, he said, Mary, uh, my, my, uh, my client, feels that he's going to allow your bidder, namely me, to buy it at the underbid price. Namely, uh, Malcolm Force said he went too high. <laughs> he, want, he, he wanted to opt out, and he wanted to let me have it at, at my bid. And I said no. <laughs> <laughs> Those are fun stories. <laughs> And anyway, that kind of thing happens at the all, all kinds of things like that. I can tell you all day long. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't get that one. A year later, since I knew Malcolm Forbes was not in the, in the market anymore, <laughs> uh, I was a successful bidder for that one, which is much better. <laughs> one of the things that the quality of the signers of the Declaration is the more letters that were signed by those signers they were signed in 1776. Mm -hmm. That elevates the collection. Mm -hmm. And so the one that I bought subsequently had more signers signed. I knew it because I had researched that beforehand. So that's the one I've got. So there's a, there's a moral here. There's a lesson for all of you. Eliminate Malcolm Forbes, <laughs> and you're all set. Um, so this is one of my personal favorites, um, which I put up uh, briefly when um, when Professor Bowling was talking. I just love, um, I love this view. I'm doing a project on the Washington Monument right now, so I love this view from 1852, which shows the completed Washington Monument, which wasn't completed, and actually shows it as it's wrong, <laughs> um, as if it is the real thing, but it is a, a vision of Washington. But I love it for the creek. 
um, and for the, for the castle, um, the sense of the mall um, in a way that we don't understand or we don't know it today, um, and the proximity of the Potomac uh, to the, to the uh, Washington Monument because there had not yet been the landfill. So I feel like there's a lot to see here. And um, you have a lot of bird's eye views. Are there things that distinguish them from, for you? I mean, why this one? You told me a great story about um, the figures in the front there. Um, because you have, um, in, in Mr. Small's office, there are two bird's eye views right on, on top of each other. Same view. Yeah, these, this is the time. same view, yeah. I have the same view by the same engraver that was done with the new dome, with the current dome and so on. This is the, the early dome. Well, the new dome that, that exists today, uh, it's the exact same view. And I explained, this, explained to you before, she said, why is this different? I said, well, the dome, but you look very carefully, all the figures down below, the people on horseback and the people walking around are exactly in the same place. <laughs> exactly. Every single person is exactly the same. So I, I love that you can learn when you collect like Mr. Small has collected and you have this vast number of images to compare, you can learn something not only about Washington, but about printmaking. Um, and the kind of laziness of, well, we'll just keep everything in the foreground exactly the same, and we're going to change the capital because that's the point. <laughs> so um, I, loved, I loved that you, were, you had noticed that. Um, so that day, then we were looking at, um, at the framed images in your office. You stood up uh, around, from around the table. I'd like everyone to read it because yep. I, I, reading is better than me telling you. Yep. So, as it's, you know, it says, to arms, to arms, Fort Sumter surrendered the rebel flag to float over the national capital at Washington. Um, and if, as we think about this collection and for use for educational purposes, um, I was wondering if there's anything you wanted to say. I mean, that's just such a dramatic, um, incredible call to arms for um, Ohio volunteers. Well, you know, we're, we live here in Washington, and, and uh, here the Civil War started, and what they're saying is they're going to have Fly the, that flag, the Confederate flag, over the nation's capital within a few months. I mean, it's a pretty scary thing when you think about it. But that, and I saw it, I said, I've got to have that for the collection. It's very dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, you all can read it, and probably none of you have ever seen it before. And I don't think there's any other that I know exist. But there are lots of posters of the Civil War, all kinds. But in my humble opinion, this is one that's most dramatic. That sense of, you know. Because it relates to Washington and, and the implications they're, they're in. And that, you know, it, they didn't know what was going to happen, right? I mean, they could, they could drum up fear, legitimate fear, um, but nobody knew what was going to happen. And subsequently, of course, the war started and, and, uh, and defend, the, defend the capital, to, to defend Washington. Uh, they had to build forts all around the city to defend it from the Confederates. And some of the forts that still exist today, as probably a lot of you know, you live in Washington, there's still some there, and there's still some trenches that are connected to forts that are in the woods. In fact, along Military Road, which is called Military Road because it, it connected some of the forts. You go up in the woods, along Military Road, and you can still see the outline of the trenches to this day. So the, the Civil War collection is, is um, very well developed um, in Mr. Small's collection. So this is um, a flag. There aren't that many um, artifacts, you know, three-dimensional artifacts in your collection, but this is one um, that's pretty amazing um, of a Union camp flag. Um, and speaking of the Civil War, um, we knew when we started to think about what would be exhibited today in the, um, in the room where we'll be soon and also what we wanted to talk about, um, we knew that we had to um, talk about this Camp Fry, Washington, D.C., because it is Washington Circle. Um, so this is our campus um, and sort of pretty much the site of the GW Hospital, um, but it was Camp Fry in the 1860s. So it's a... It's, it should be near and dear uh, to all of us. 
are there some of your Civil War, some pieces from the Civil War part of your collection that you were especially well, the, interested? <laughs> the poster that tells about the, about the flag and the firework that mm -hmm. is to me That's the, your most, favorite. the most dramatic one. Uh, the Civil War is only part of it, but I have maps that show all the Civil War forts right. around the city, and a lot of them are still here. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing, one thing you talk about, the, 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 the monuments, the stones, the one-mile markers, you know, Washington, they decided back in, in the in 19th century to give back the Virginia part of what was laid out to be Washington to give it back to Virginia. But the stones are still there. And you, when you ever, I've walked some of those stones and seen where they were. Mm -hmm. And of course now Alexandria and, and Arlington are all built up. And one of the stones is in a church parking lot. <laughs> One's in someone's backyard, but they're there. They don't just, they don't, they haven't taken them away, but it's a little hard to go in someone's backyard to see it, but <laughs> This is. One's on Western Avenue and Eastern Avenue. Uh, you can drive along those streets and you still see them just mm -hmm. by driving along the streets. But in Virginia, they're, everything's been changed. Right. So they're really hard to find. Um. This is, this is an amazing, this is the reward poster for um, finding Booth. For, so there's a $50,000 reward for finding, uh, for information leading to the arrest of Booth, and then um, lesser awards for the uh, co-conspirators. But as um, James Good has noted, it's, its authenticity is verifiable because the name of one of the conspirators, James Harold, is spelled incorrectly. Um, and when forgeries of this were made for, for sale, uh, later on, his name was spelled correctly. So we know this is good because it's, it, has a, it has a mistake. So Harold is spelled with an A, H-A-R-O-L-D. Um. Everyone, so they made obviously more than one poster that they were for, for the reward, but very few to this day have the pictures on them. Mm. Mm -hmm. I have dealers calling me, Albert, why don't you give it to me to sell? It, it's very valuable, and, and uh, so I've got calls. I get calls a couple of times a year from dealers. Albert, won't you give it to me to sell? Well, and then I've got institutions that want to borrow it. And in fact, Ford's Theater asked me the other day. I'm on the board of Ford's Theater, and they want to borrow it for the new exhibit they're going to have. And I said, I would, of course, I'd lend it to them. That was actually one of my questions I wanted to ask about lending to exhibitions. Are there other um, notable pieces that you've lent? Well, listen, there's no reason to keep these things sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. So people should share them. And then when in larger communities, we mm -hmm. share them. Mm -hmm. So this will be exhibited at Ford's? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to sort of um, wrap up my formal questions, and then we will open open it to um, to the audience. But I wanted to to sort of compare three images. Um, this is a professor in me; I can't help it. <laughs> um, but there's this wonderful view um, for, for when, from when Washington was vying for to be the site of the 1892 World's Fair, right? So Chicago won. <laughs> um, but this was a plan, a vision for how what what the mall might look like if Washington got to host the fair. Um, and then there's this bird's eye view, and both of them um, primarily focus on the monumental core. So in Mr. Small's collection, we get a very good view and views and lots of information about Washington as, as a capital. But then we have this incredible um, print, which is very, very difficult <laughs> to see here. Um, but when you get up close to it, you, you have can. to get very close. So here's a detail. Um, so this is from 1920, and I think as a businessman and as a developer, this would be really fun for you. Um, and as a Washingtonian, and as a, as a, are you a third generation Washingtonian? Is that right? What? Are you a third generation Washingtonian? Mm -hmm. um, so somebody who, who knows the city well and has helped build the city as a developer. Um, to give a sense, the collection also gives a sense of Washington as a commercial place. 
Um, so if you look carefully here. Um, well, you have to look at it. I think we have it on exhibit. It should be on, right. It's in the other room. Get, you have to get up close to see it because on the top of each building, it's got the name on it. You can't see it from here. Right. When you get up close to the actual thing in the, when we're having the dining room, it'll show that. And some of what them. Happened, <laughs> I just bought this last year. I go to Baltimore to the, to the antique show, and they have a section for dealers who sell maps, manuscripts, about 40, 50 dealers, and there are about 500 dealers selling all kinds of antiques and jewelry and art and everything else. I see this now. I've never seen it before. It's only 1922. It's not that old. And I bought it. But it's so big that I couldn't put it in my car. <laughs> so the dealer said, I'll bring it to your office. So it took about a week or so to get there. He brings it to the office. And he walks in, in my office. But it's, it's big, about that big. It just wouldn't fit in the car. He said, Mr. Small, I had no idea what you collected. He just was overwhelmed. He, just, he said, Mr. Small, I just can't believe what you got here. He said, I'm in heaven, <laughs> <laughs> looking at everything. It, it, it's a fabulous piece. Um, some of the buildings that I noticed. Everyone just, sees it. Just can't, you have to go look at it. Out there. Yeah, it has some things to look for, the Willard and Pepco. <laughs> so you get a real sense of Washington as a place of business and life and not just um, a monumental core. Then you have to realize that a person did this by hand. Mm -hmm. There's no, no other way of doing it. And you, when you see the details in it, you say, how could a person do that? Mm -hmm. And it's really marvelous to take the time to have done all that. Every little line is all hand drawn. It's amazing. Um, so I think that um, to wrap up, I'll just say that um, I think our audience has a much um, better appreciation now than they did an hour or so ago um, about this incredible record of Washington that GW is so um, delighted to, to be receiving from Mr. Small. Um, and so I just was wanted to ask you um, what your vision for the collection is at GW. What would you like to see happen at the George Washington University? Because you have a good audience here um, of people who might help make that happen. Well, first of all, as we hear, the nation's capital, the city of Washington, there's nowhere to go to see anything about the history of Washington. It doesn't exist anywhere. There's nowhere in the city that you can see what we I've created to give it to George Washington University. So it'll be a mecca for people who are interested in the history. You go to the National Gallery of Art, you go to the Smithsonian Library of Congress, the archives. There's nothing, a few things on the wall, but nothing but the history of this capital. People come from Washington from all over the world. There's nowhere to learn about the history I've ever seen anything about it, anywhere. None of those institutions have anything to represent it. Now you're going to have it here at GW. That's our charge. <laughs> so are there any questions? Open it up for questions. I just have to ask how often you were able to withstand the bids going above you <laughs> as a veteran. How, 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 what's your batting average? Can you, are you tough enough to say no often? In other words, when the bids go high and it gets below your threshold, oh, okay. how often are you able to say okay, great. Uh, next time? Well, I have a strong heart. Yes. <laughs> Fortunately. <laughs> well, I don't know how many of y'all in the room have been been the auctions, but it's uh, I've uh, I was underbid. I was I was the underbidder on a first folio of Shakespeare, which was done in sixteen twenty three. Many, many years ago. This is a time when the Japanese were buying things of that sort. It was known that Japanese were buying them. And I was the underbidder. And I think it sold for $650,000. I 
back in this about 15 years ago. Wow. I breathed pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was a tough one, I, but I you know I could see that they were going to keep going. The one thing is to stop, and they bit, and they they get it. But if you bit again, they would keep going. They keep going up. So I didn't get it. <laughs> Subsequently, I made it known throughout the, that part of the market that I was interested in acquiring a first folio, and. A dealer had one in London, notified me, and I went over to London to look at it. I flew over on the Concord, back and forth in one day. So you're a collector, that's the kind of thing you have to do. So I go over to London and look at it, and I'm on the board of the Folger Library, and I went with, met with the curator before I went, and I talked about it with her, and she said, let me take you down the vault. And show you, and show you the uh, the 87 folios that they have. And let me show you. She said, "Let me show you what you have to look for." Mm -hmm. So she showed me what to look for, and I went over to London and looked. I took notes. Came back and sh showed her. She said, "Mr. Small," she said, "I don't think you should buy that one. It's got." some things that I don't think are worth your bargain. So she talked me out of buying it. <laughs> to this day, I could wring her neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell that story a lot. But I still like to wring her neck. And meanwhile, the last one that came for sale was six and a half million dollars. Oh. Yeah. So you know how you feel there. I think we that have makes a, a it question. even worse. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to wring your neck again. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can we can wrap up with the story. Albert's got he collects everything. Cars, I mean, it's phenomenal. There's twenty four seven. I think he's got a clone somewhere that you know goes out, and does all this. But he told us a story about a letter. Caesar. Remember? Mm -hmm. Caesar Rodney? Yeah, mm -hmm. Caesar, Caesar Rodney. Share with the audience that story, please. <laughs> okay, good story. <laughs> How many people in the room knew who Caesar Rodney was? This is a good room. <laughs> two, two people in the whole room, all right? Think about it. He was the signer of the Declaration of Independence from Delaware. If you ever go to Wilmington, there's a statue of him in the square in downtown Wilmington. He's the hero of Delaware. Great big, huge statue. What happened on the 1st of, 1st of July, 1776, there was a preliminary vote in Philadelphia for the uh, voting to declare independence from Great Britain. And Delaware, they had three delegates. There were two delegates present at that time. One was for independence and one was against it. So therefore, they had no vote. Because there were one for, one against. So there's nothing. The third uh, representative was Caesar Rodney. He was down in Delaware when the the voting was taking place in Philadelphia. So the delegate from Delaware who was for independence sent a courier, messenger, courier down to find him in Delaware and bring him back to Philadelphia for the final vote, which is going to be on the 4th of July. So here's what happened. Caesar Rodney was down there helping to round up troops to fight the British then. They found him, and he comes back to Delaware, back from Delaware to Philadelphia by horseback. Of course, that's the only way you, you travel then. And he gets there, and, and he, he votes. And it, so the Delaware delegation was two to one, so they voted for independence. So he writes a letter that night to his brother back in Delaware, Dear Tom, 
I, this is July 4th now. You, and the, he writes it on the 4th of July. The, the letters are 4th of July, July 4th, 1776, Philadelphia. Dear Tom, I arrived here through thunder and rain. That's what you get in the summertime, as you know from here. I arrived here through <coughs> thunder and rain in time to cast my vote in the matter of independence. The vote was unanimous. In the matter will be sent to the printers tonight and distributed the following day to the armies, the generals of the armies and the mayors of the cities. And that's the only letter that was ever written that, that day that tells that story. It's probably one of the most valuable letters that exist. And so I had I bid and bought that letter, of course. But that was a, then I'll finish the story about the letter. Bob wants me to tell that part of it. That was a major auction, a major letter, and there's no way anyone else was going to buy it. I, I've determined I had to have that letter. So the auction house in New York was packed and jammed with people. In the back of the room, just like you got a television, a camera up there at the end, there must have been half a dozen media cameras there in the auction. I don't know why, but there were. And so the auction went off, and, and uh, it, the bidding went up, and, and I'm raising my hand, and the other people down there in the front were raising their hand, and it got pretty high. And but as, I told, as I told you, I said, when you, when you determine to get something, you really have to have the fortitude and guts to be able to, to go for it. So I. I went for it and I got it. And then as soon as I got it, all those cameras swung over on me because they were from Delaware and they wanted to, they wanted to, they wanted to photograph and take the media. They wanted to show on the media that night to bring that letter back to Delaware. That was what they came for. <laughs> this is New York, the auction. And, and they all wanted, to, they, all these, the television, the newspapers, everybody were from Delaware, they wanted to tell, they wanted to tell the story back home. Well, of course, when this guy from Maryland at that point, <laughs> got it, well, they were, they were angry at me. And little ladies in the audience with her, they came up from Delaware, they had their umbrellas, they shook them at me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was a pretty dramatic situation. <laughs> And so for years, I never drove through Delaware. I was in <laughs> <laughs> And to top it off, I got a call about two years later <clears throat> from, the, from the, uh, one of the senators from Delaware up on the hill. He wanted me to come to lunch. Uh, I had no idea. I, what he wanted to do was talk me into giving a letter to them. <laughs> And then I had visitors from the Historic Society come down to my home. And so I was, then I had people I know in Delaware were, were bugging me about it. So for several years, I, I was plagued by people wanting to bring it up to Delaware. <laughs> finally, finally I, I gave in and, and uh, I was asked if I would lend it to an exhibit up there. And I said, well, at that point, I had promised a letter to the University of Virginia. And I said, you'll have to check with them before I can lend it, because it, it's not really in my possession anymore. So they did all that. So what they did ultimately, my office was in downtown Washington on Connecticut Avenue. They sent a state trooper down from Delaware with a great big hat like that, <laughs> state trooper car, pulls up, you know, never see, you've never probably ever seen a Delaware State Trooper car in your life in Washington, D.C. <laughs> they just don't. Well, there it pulls up to my office in Connecticut Avenue, and the trooper comes up there, big hat and a uniform, takes the letter back to Delaware. And of course, when they return it, I do the same thing. I'm only sorry I never was there. I never took a picture of him by the car, <laughs> taking the thing, but I didn't, but that's the story. Thank you. Are we set? Are there any more questions? All right.